All right, so funny story. During the course of sort of planning my crossover, I've gone from thinking this is going to be relatively straightforward to this is going to be a nightmare to this is actually really easy. And I'll tell you why. At first, I, like many people, figured I'll just Google crossover calculator. Yeah, I found pages and pages of different calculators. And all you need to do is tell it the impedance of your drivers, the crossover frequency, and the type and order of crossover, or the type and the slope of crossover that you want. So you read a bit about the different crossovers. That's Butterworth, Linkwitz, Riley, things like that. I decide, okay, I want a second order Linkwitz, Riley. I think that would be suitable. And I wanted it at 250 hertz, where my excite is starting to sort of tail off anyway, and I just want to fill in the low end with a woofer. Excellent. Tap it all in and it goes, yeah, you need this inductor, you need this capacitor, blah, blah, blah. So I just rushed out and bought those. And then I did a bit more reading and people are like, well, that doesn't make sense because what the online calculator does is that it assumes that your drivers are basically resistors or they act like resistors, meaning they have the same impedance regardless of frequency. And that's not true. Resistors do that. That's what makes them resistors. Speaker drivers don't. If you've seen the charts, you'll see that they kind of look like that. In fact, here's one on the screen right now so you can see what I'm talking about. So this is an 8 ohm driver, but you can see that the impedance varies wildly depending on what frequency is being fed into it. This is the missing piece that those online calculators don't take into account. And it can really screw up your crossover design. So then I went, uh, I'm going to have to measure my drivers and, you know, simulate it in software and blah, blah, blah. So I started to go down that road. Then my components showed up and I'm like, well, I'll just build that crossover anyway and see how it sounds. As you'll see a bit later in the video, it sounds great. And I was wondering, like, am I really that lucky that I just happened upon the right components? And it's yes and no. But to explain that further, I'm going to jump on the computer and show you exactly why I think it works in this case. Okay, let's start with the woofer. This is the spec sheet for the Dayton Audio Classic woofer, which is the model I chose for my build. The bottom panel shows the nominal frequency response of the driver with the black line describing the normal on-axis response. We can see that the driver has a strong, fairly linear response below about 1000 Hz. From there, it rises smoothly until about 2.2 kHz, at which point it just falls apart completely. You'd always want to cross this driver well below the breakup frequency here. In my case, I'm crossing it way down at 250 hertz, so it's well out of the picture before this point. So far, so good. As I mentioned earlier, the other piece of the puzzle is the driver's impedance, and we can see it plotted here as well. The graph starts with the nominal 8 ohms, but quickly spikes all the way to over 50 ohms at what's called the resonant frequency. And we can infer that due to this huge impedance, the sound from this driver will drop off pretty hard below about 50 hertz. But the most important part of the graph for our purposes is that it shows a consistent impedance between that 50 hertz and the crossover frequency of 250 hertz. It's all extremely close to the nominal frequency of 8 ohms. It looks to me like it might be touching 9 ohms at the crossover point, which isn't far off at all. This is important because the component values given by the crossover calculator are based on 8 ohms. So the component values are right on for this driver in this application. Or to put that another way, I just happen to be using this driver in its impedance sweet spot, so the crossover calculator has an easy job to do. Now let's take a look at the exciter. It's a little less ideal, and you can see that the resonant frequency spike is right around the crossover frequency. I'd prefer it to be lower, below the crossover, but this is better than it being above the crossover where this driver is contributing more to the overall sound. 
One octave up from my crossover is 500 hertz, and you can see that at this point, the driver is right at its 4 ohm nominal impedance. The component values calculated for this driver will therefore also be accurate. It's also worth noting that the impedance spike of the exciter tops out at only 16 ohms. So, for the most part, the calculations I made initially are pretty accurate for this specific scenario. Let's see how this thing measures. First, I wanted to get some baseline measurements. The red line is just the panel, and green is just the woofer. Neither have any filters at this stage. The obvious thing here is that the woofer is quite a bit louder than the panel. To combat this, I added a series resistor. First a 2.4 ohm, then 4 ohm, and then finally 8 ohm. My next biggest resistor was 20 ohm, which I thought was a bit much, so I stuck with the 8. Now this doesn't look too bad around the crossover frequency, and would clearly result in a stronger mid bass down to about 55 hertz compared to the panel by itself. Let's now replace these individual lines with a combined measurement, shown in blue. The next obvious issue is that huge mountain that leads up to the woofer's breakup at a bit over 2 kHz. A 10 millihenry inductor on the woofer circuit acts as a low pass filter, and this brown line shows that it almost completely removes that hump. Next I added a high pass filter on the panel, in the form of an 80 microfarad capacitor in series. Well, more accurately, I wired up two 40 microfarad caps in parallel to do the same thing, as I couldn't get such a large capacitor. This turquoise line isn't very different, but there was an audible difference in that the panel already sounded cleaner due to the rolled off base. Here's what the panel looks like on its own, now with the addition of a parallel inductor, making a second order high pass filter. And now the green line shows the combined response with second order filters in place on both sides of the crossover. Not looking too bad now. The base doesn't look too strong however, so I tried removing that series resistor from the woofer circuit. The result is shown in purple. Surprisingly, the woofer didn't suddenly become overpowering again. With just a subtle lift in the mid-base, which is more in line with the mid-range. For some reason, this measurement contains a more pronounced dip at 3 kHz, which is pretty crappy. Changing something in the woofer circuit shouldn't affect what's happening up in panel land at all, as far as I know. So anyway, this is where I'm at so far. This range from 80 Hz up to 2.5 kHz is all within 7 decibels, which I think is a great result. The low end is subject to increased room effects, which I can't really help, but I suspect it's slightly stronger than what's being shown here, at least down to about 55 Hz. Of course, I'll have to do a bit more listening to this setup, and I might tweak this further in a future video. Okay, so I've spent the last couple of hours building this crossover one component at a time, measuring in between each iteration, listening to music, you know, all that kind of stuff. It sounds shockingly good. That, that's what I have to say about it. So at the moment I, I've built up the full crossover. It's a second order Linkwitz Riley with a calculated crossover point at 250 hertz. Uh, I did originally put a resistor on the woofer circuit. I've taken that out. It seemed to mess up the phase a little bit and that issue's basically gone now. And I, I also felt that it, it did bring down the woofer a little bit too much. So I'm much happier with uh, where the sound is without that. So you've seen the charts, or I'm about to show you the charts. I don't know how this will all edit together, but whatever. I'm going to put some music on and try and get a decent recording of it.
So that's it. I hope that recording managed to come through uh, okay. I, I get that. Obviously, it's not perfect. Uh, hopefully, it's better than nothing. Eventually, I'd like to do a high-quality recording of these with a nice mic in a treated room once they're all finished. Um, but till then, this is what we have. So I think that's about it for today's video. Thanks very much for watching. If you do have any comments or questions or anything, leave them down below. I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, next time I'm going to be actually assembling the, the finished crossovers. And uh, after that we can start finishing these speakers and painting them up and looking all good. It's pretty exciting. I, I'm excited. It, they're starting to sound real nice. So um, hopefully you'll join me then. Catch you next time.